Whether you're a Christian or not, guys, if you read the Bible, it doesn't take you long to figure out our God is a God of love. Amen? God love, his love is, is the entire, it's what the entire Christian religion is about. Okay? And, I mean, the most well-known Bible verse in the world is based on love. We're going to look at that. We're going to look at John 3, 16. And guys, I want y'all to read this with me, okay? One, two, three. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So again, that is, that is the main verse that everybody knows. You don't have to be a Christian and you know about that verse, right? And it's based on God's love. Jesus even based our entire role of discipleship on love. I want to look at John 13, 35. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Okay? The Bible is even very clear that true love only comes from God because God is love. We're going to look at 1 John 4, 7 through 8. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Amen. Throughout my life, guys, growing up as a Christian, the love of God has always been the focal point of my upbringing. Uh, it, it, it's what I've always been taught, right? The love of God. That's what we always hear about. Make no mistake about it, guys. When you think of God, love should be the first thing that you think of. It should be the very first thing. And when you share the gospel with others, the main point you should always stress to them is how much God loves us. Correct? Correct? Thank you. Our entire belief revolves around the love of God. However, even though God is a God of love, and even though God is love, we need to understand that our God is also a just God. And because he is a just God, there are things that God actually hates. Now, I bet some of you are thinking, now, wait a minute, Michael. We're always taught to love all things. God loves all things. We should love all things. Guys, I'm sorry to disappoint you. That's not what the Bible says at all. In fact, the Bible actually says there is a time to hate. We're going to look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. For everything, there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to harvest, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to tear down, a time to build up. A time to cry, a time to laugh, a time to grieve, and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones, and a time to gathering stones. A time to embrace, and a time to turn away. A time to search, and a time to quit searching. A time to keep, and a time to throw away. A time to tear down, or excuse me, a time to tear, and a time to mend. A time to be quiet. Mikey? And a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. There's actually a time to hate. I want to look at a couple other verses real quick. We'll look at Proverbs 18, 13 and Amos 5, 15. All who fear the Lord will hate evil. Therefore, I hate pride and arrogance, corruption and perverse speech. Hate evil and love what is good. Turn your courts into true halls of justice. Perhaps even yet the Lord God of heaven's armies will have mercy on the remnant of his people. So, today's title is, What God Hates. Now, I really need you to catch something from these scriptures, guys, that we just read. I want you to notice God never says that he hates people. Never says that. God loves all people, but he hates their sin. We as Christians are called to do the same thing. We are called to love people, but we are not called to love everything they do. Amen. This is where the saying, and I know y'all know it, love the sinner, hate the sin. It's where that comes into play. Guys, there's nine things mentioned in Scripture that God hates, and we're going to go over all nine of these today. Seven of the nine 
are all listed in Proverbs chapter 6. We're going to go to Proverbs chapter 6 and read verses 16 through 19. I'm actually going to give you a minute if you got your Bible to get there. I hope you got your Bible. Open your Bible and get there because you'll be able to check this out, take some notes, so forth. 6, 16 through 19. Proverbs in the middle of your Bible. Six, sixteen through 19. Go ahead and pull that up for me, Nick. There are six things the Lord hates. No, seven things that he detests. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that plots evil, feet that race to do wrong, a false witness who pours out lies, a person who sows discord in a family. Now, I took these and we made a list. If you could pull that next one up for me, Nick. This is the list, guys. Okay, haughty eyes, lying tongue, so forth. We just went through this. We're going to go each one of these one by one. We're going to break these down, and we're going to start with haughty eyes. Okay, that means a proud look. That's what that means, guys. God hates it when people act arrogant, cocky, prideful, entitled. Simply put, people hate, or excuse me, simply put, people with haughty eyes, they think they're better than others. I don't know about y'all, man. I really struggle with entitlement. There's only one person that's entitled, and that's the only man that walked this earth sinless. Amen? Nobody else is entitled to anything. Your pastor included. Trust me. You can ask my wife that. Okay? The, <laughs> the best biblical example of someone like this is Pharaoh in the book of Exodus. Okay? Everybody, most people are going to know this story, obviously, but you know, Pharaoh, you know, Moses is supposed to go. God says, go to Pharaoh. Tell him to let my people go. He goes to Pharaoh. He tells Pharaoh this. First of all, that took a lot of courage. Amen. He goes to Pharaoh. He says, God says, let his people go. And this is Pharaoh's remark. Who is this so-called God? I answer to no one. I am God of Egypt. Okay, right? That's what he says. Well, 10 plagues later, how'd that go for him? I mean, it's just the honest truth. Guys, God cannot stand people that are cocky and arrogant, especially towards him. Especially towards him. This reminds me, guys, so not, not too long ago, I was, I was exercising one morning at the gym, and there were these three young dudes. They was probably 18, 19, you know. This was during the summertime, so they were probably high school kids. They were over there. They were doing deadlifts. All right, and, 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 and they thought they had a lot of weight on there. And they were making sure everybody else in there thought they had a lot of weight on there too. First of all, man, don't be grunting in the gym. That's just annoying. You know what I'm saying? They over there screaming, you know, lifting this weight. And they're only doing one thing of it, you know. They're just going down and getting in there, pick it up one time. And I'm sitting back, I'm watching this. I'm thinking, God, I know you don't like haughty eyes. And you all about humility. If you want me to, I'll go humble these kids. <laughs> about that time I get through praying, I look up, they over there flexing in the mirror. That's all I needed to see. It's like that was confirmation. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I walk over to these guys. I said, gentlemen, are y'all done with this? They said, yes. I threw on four more plates and did a set of eight. And I just turned around and walked away. Didn't say another word. Just done. You know what I'm saying? Well, I racked my weights because you got a gym etiquette. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you rack your weights. But I got up and I walked away. What they didn't know was, okay, I might have taught them a lesson. And I probably humbled them. My back was killing me after that, man. <laughs> God said, I'll teach you. I'm going to let you teach them, but then I'm going to teach you. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> it's that old age. That's right. Y'all, it was cool, though, making little teenagers look bad. I ain't going to lie, but it was cool. God hates haughty eyes. The second thing God hates is a lying tongue. Show of hands. Who in here has ever told a lie? Show of hands. If you didn't raise your hand, you just did. I promise you that. Everybody, guys, everybody's told a lie. I promise you that, guys. You know, God hates it. He hates it. And, and we're, let's look at Proverbs 12, 19. I want to look at that real quick. 
Truthful words stand the test of time, but lies are soon exposed. Man, listen, how solid is that verse? Lies are soon exposed. When I was a senior in high school, that's when the ice storm of 2000 came through. Y'all remember that right before Christmas? Everything froze. Y'all know I'm from Cass County. I was living in Atlanta. And our house is like right in the middle of Atlanta, okay? So now keep in mind, this is my B.C. days, okay, before Christmas. Christ, okay? So I'm young and I'm stupid, and, and I decide to hush. So since we're in the middle of town, I was like, man, we got to have a New Year's party. And my house is in the middle of town. So I asked my dad, I said, Dad, you know, I got some buddies, just a few guys, just a few guys. You want to come over and play cards, you know? He said, son, I'll tell you what. He said, uh, me and your mom, they had a party to go to, New Year's party or something. He said, I'll tell you what, he said, that's fine. He said, I'll have your mom back home at 1 o'clock. And he said, this house better be spotless. And then he looked at me and said, how many people are going to be there? I said, oh, there's like seven, eight dudes, man. Just, just guys, just dudes hanging out playing cards. So, so here's what happened. So the ice melted a few, like a week later, I guess. Dad comes to me, wakes me up in the morning. He says, son, how many people came to that party? First of all, y'all want y'all to know I cleaned that house spotless, okay? One thing broke. My mom never found out about it. She just found out about it right now. <laughs> it wasn't anything important, I promise. If it had been important, I'd have glued it back together. But, but anyway, a week later, the ice melts, the snow melts. Son, I'm going to give you one more chance. How many people were at this house? I said, Dad, why do you ask? He said, look out the window. Y'all, it looked like glitter. Everybody was digging their beer cans down in the snow. It melted. <laughs> so the sun's gleaming on all this, and he said, there's no way seven or eight of you guys drank all that. <laughs> guys, all, first of all, I need you to understand, it's not just lies that are exposed. The Bible tells us that all sin is exposed. All sin. At some point, it will come out into the light, literally, like the sun, you know, was gleaming on that. Literally, it will come out. One of the things that I constantly try to tell people that are done wrong by somebody else is be patient. Be patient. Don't attack. But be patient. Sit back. Let God handle it. Because I promise you, all sin is exposed. Guys, that's why God, he, he hates a liar. You know, our God is a God of truth. You know what the devil is? King of lies. And he hates it. He absolutely hates it, guys. Why does somebody tell a lie? Don't you think about this. Why does somebody tell a lie? Fear. Amen. Fear. You lie because you're afraid of what the outcome of the truth may be. That's the whole thing. You're scared to death of that. Guys, one thing that I've learned in my walk is to never face sin with fear, but you face it with faith. When you're in a situation where you've messed up, don't lie. Don't face that with fear. You face it with the faith of God. You know, when I mess up, and I know i got to go tell the truth about something that I messed up on, you know, that's the first thing I do is, God, I need your help here. I'm not going to be fearful and do the wrong thing. I'm going to have faith in you that you're going to be there when I go and I tell this to an individual or when I fess up to whatever it is that I have to do, I'm going to have faith that you're there. Guys, if you go into it and you attack it that way, the other person is so much more likely to show you grace and mercy because guess what? God's present. When you lie about it and it comes back on you, there is no grace and mercy. Amen? God hates lies. He hates lies. The third thing God hates are hands that shed innocent blood. Innocent blood. Notice I said innocent blood. Okay, just making sure you caught that. Shedding innocent blood is murder, guys. There's a difference between murder and self-defense. You know, me protecting my home, if somebody comes in, that's not innocent blood. And again, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, or maybe this last week. You know, for the love of my children and the love of my wife, I'm going to protect my family. I'll ask questions later. But the thing is, guys, that's not innocent blood. God hates Someone that kills innocent people. 
to protect yourself, God expects you to do that. He expects you to take care of yourself. I know we talked about this a couple weeks ago, but there is no one more innocent than an unborn child. This verse, to me, is even more proof that God is 100% against abortion. God hates hands that shed innocent blood, so we as Christians should always do all that we can to protect the innocent. Amen? The fourth thing God hates is a heart that plots evil or a scheming heart, okay? Jesus had to uh, deal with people like this himself. We're going to look at Luke eleven fifty three through 54. As Jesus was leaving, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees became hostile and tried to provoke him with many questions. They wanted to trap him into saying something they could use against him. When you plot to do evil, guys, your sin is no different than that of these Pharisees that were plotting against Jesus Christ. No difference, guys. You know, a, a story of this is, is King David and Bathsheba, you know, King Caesar, you know, he's over there bathing. Is that why her name's Bathsheba, by the way? Like, I always wondered that, like Bathsheba. It's easy to remember that way. She had a husband named Uriah. That was her husband's name. And, and a lot of y'all, again, know this story, but this is just a perfect example of the plotting of evil that goes on. But David, you know, oh, I, oh, so, so now you've got an affair, okay? And he's going to do everything he can, first of all, to lie and cover it up. We know that. You just go look at the book. You'll see that. And then he's trying to plot evil against Uriah by sending him to the front of the line in battle. The odds of you making it out of there alive at the front of the line are pretty slim to none. And, and David knew that. He knew exactly what he was doing. What we also know is that after that, chaos followed David pretty much for the rest of his life. Guys, what I need you to understand is when you plot evil against someone, it's going to come back on you. I promise you that. A heart that does that, I always struggle with do they even have Jesus Christ in their heart? Now, obviously, we know David did. David made a huge mistake. He repented afterwards. You can read it throughout the Word. But I struggle with people when I see that. That's always my first thought is, if they're that evil, if they'll plot that way, I'm worried about their salvation. Very worried about it. What you need to understand also is situations like this, I mean, just adultery, number one, which went on in this story, that doesn't just affect the two involved. It can affect the family. It can affect chil uh, children. That's the big one. What did they do wrong? They didn't do anything wrong. Your friends. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day that was talking about that. Years and years ago, the, 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 that she was married before and, and a husband and cheated on her and so forth, and then he ends up leaving. He doesn't have any family. He doesn't have any friends because they all pretty much disowned him. Now, here's the thing, guys. We always should forgive. Always should forgive. But at the same time, if somebody doesn't have a heart change and somebody doesn't repent, it's kind of hard to forgive when that's the situation. So what you got to do there, you got, you got to forgive them in your heart. And, and then you kind of got to distance yourself. You don't want to be around that terror or that heartache again. That's just stupidity, right? God gives you a brain, make good decisions. That's called discernment, you know. But guys, again, plotting evil, a heart that does that, it's a domino effect after. I need you to understand that. It affects a whole lot more than just you and another individual that may be involved. God hates a heart that plots evil. The fifth thing that God hates are feet that race to do wrong. I want to look at Proverbs 4, 25 and 26. Look straight ahead. Fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. This is the simplest way that I can break down these two verses, guys. If you keep your feet out of a bad place, you will not be in a bad place. Pretty simple. When I was younger, I was working at a place, and I was working with a guy. And uh, every Friday, we got paid. This man would get his paycheck, and at 6 o'clock when it was time to leave, he'd go straight, cash the check, go grab a case of beer, 
and hit the casino. Throw his money away. This individual ended up getting fired, by the way, from where we were working. And I didn't know much about him for years later. And then I ran into somebody that knew him and I asked. I said, what happened to him? And I kind of told this story to them. They said, well, he didn't change. And I said, in fact, he's dead. I said, well, what happened? He said, well, he kept going to the casinos, ended up, he got a girlfriend, so he lost his family, lost his wife, lost his kids. Then he got three DWIs, they put him in jail. And while he was in jail, he died of liver disease. Guys, keep your feet on the right path. I'm going to tell you right now, even when you're on the right path, it's still hard. But when you get on the wrong path, you're doomed. This world makes it hard enough to try and live righteously and stay on that right path. Why in the world would you flirt with evil? Keep your feet on the right path. There's a simple counterattack for this, guys, of keeping your feet away from the wrong path. And that is simply to listen to the Holy Spirit. And that's where that relationship is so important. You've got to continue to build your relationship with the Holy Spirit. Continue to seek Him. Listen to Him. He'll always lead you down the righteous path. God hates feet that race to do wrong. The sixth thing God hates is a false witness who pours out lies. Most people read this and they immediately think of false prophets. And although they fit in this category, that is not all of who God is talking about here. These are people who start rumors about someone with the intent to hurt that person or to destroy their reputation. The perfect example of this in the Bible is 1 Kings chapter 21. Excuse me, yeah, chapter 21. Some of y'all may know this story. It's Naboth's vineyard. Some of you will know this story. But King Ahab and his wife Jezebel. So what happened was, King Ahab wanted this vineyard. He wanted it. Well, Ahab said, I'm not going to sell it to you. This was my family land. This was given to us. This is an heirloom. This is like what we're so proud of. So, so the king, he goes back to the palace. And he's over crying about it. You know, Jezebel walks in. You know, his wife, Jezebel, walks in. Says, what's the matter with you, king? He says, well, I want this vineyard. He won't give it to me. You know what she says? We'll get it. So what she ends up doing is she sends letters to the courts and they end up calling this man to the courts. They have two people that sit next to him and basically lie about this man saying that he denied God. He was this evil person and they put him to death. Jezebel goes back to the king and says, I got your vineyard. Well, here's the cool part. First of all, don't mess with God's people. Okay. This man with the vineyard was a godly man. And what's sad is not only did he die, his whole family, they ended up killing his whole family. Man, the, the Bible's rough sometimes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, man. Mikey, you lived during that time, didn't you? <laughs> Mikey, yeah, he's probably there, you know? You know, it's funny, man. Every time I read that story about the donkey, I think about you. You know what I'm saying? In the Old Testament. <laughs> so what happens is, is Elijah, the prophet Elijah, God tells him to go tell the king that he knows about it. And he tells him. He says, you're going to die, and the dogs are going to lick your blood, and they're going to lick it from your chariot. And then he's not done. He, he ends up saying, and also Jezebel, she's going to die, and the dogs are going to eat her flesh. That's exactly what happened. Guys, don't mess with God's people. Don't mess with God's people. You know, I always think about that. When you think about a godly person, that anointing of the Holy Spirit that's on them, evil can feel that. And I'm telling you right now, evil people that get around people, again, this is so important, why you got to have that strong relationship with the Holy Spirit. When you get evil around you, they sense it. They don't want none of that. you got to stay on guard. Keep building that relationship. Let the Holy Spirit protect you from that. I, do, I want to pull up one more verse. Galatians 6, 7 through 8. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh 
from the flesh will reap destruction. You do reap what you sow. It's biblical. It's not an old wise tale. Okay. The seventh thing that God hates is a person who sows discord in a family or between brothers, like Christians, or even a church. Okay. That, that's what this is talking about here. I want to look at Psalm 133.1. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Show of hands, how many of you like when your home is in unity? Yeah, right? Okay. If you didn't raise your hand, you're sitting by your wife, I'll pray for you. Okay. Think about it, guys. When your home is in unity, your life is so much better. Show of hands, who likes it when your church is in unity? Man. When the church is in unity, the movement of God is evident. The building is filled with joy, peace, love, and miracles. Why do you think this is? Why do you think unity makes things so much better? God is a God of unity. What's he say? When two or more are gathered, what happens? God shows up. So if your home or church is divided and in total chaos, somehow... Some way, the devil has crept in. I'm going to make this very simple for you guys. Where there is unity, God is present. Where there is division, the devil is present. He's a divider, plain and simple. This is why God hates it when someone sows discord. Guys, I need you to grasp this. I really do. When there's division somewhere, the devil has crept in. It doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter it's your home, your job with your relationship with your children, the church. You know, I mean, that's the honest truth. Us here at the church, our leadership, if something's going wrong, that's the first thing we think of. Where did he get in? Let's go attack him. What did we allow? How did we allow this in the door? That's the first thing that we think of because that's what causes division. Somewhere he's crept in. And you've got to be aware of that. And here's the thing, again, I'm going to go back to the relationship with the Holy Spirit. I keep doing this like he's like surrounding me here, you know what I'm saying? That is kind of how I visualize it, like he's over me and I've got this bubble that protects me, you know what I'm saying? So, so the Holy Spirit, guys, again, if you have that strong relationship, this is the cool part. You'll catch the division either before it happens or you'll catch it quicker so you can stomp it out immediately. Because here's the problem, guys, and I think y'all can grasp this. You know, the devil is like a wild two-year-old. When you let a two-year-old in a playroom, they fix in a to it's total chaos. There's toys everywhere, food everywhere, Cheeto fingerprints, all kinds of nasty stuff. You know what I'm saying? The devil, when you let him in your home and you don't kick him out, more chaos, more division. That relationship with the Holy Spirit, you can stop that so much faster. Amen? God hates it when someone sows discord. So those are the seven things that God hates from Proverbs chapter 6. But there are two other things in the Bible that are talked about that God hates as well. The eighth thing God hates is violence and abuse. I want to go look at Psalm 11.5. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, he hates with a passion. We just read Proverbs chapter 6. He said he hated it. He didn't say with a passion. He hates it with a passion. Violence. And what's a stem of violence? Abuse. He hates it with a passion. Guys, I said this a while back. You know, I'm a big cowboy fan, right? You ain't got to say that. They're terrible right now. Don't, you ain't got to say all that. But here's the thing, because I'm a Cowboy fan, brought up, born and raised since 1989 is when I started watching them, you know, three Super Bowls later. Anyway, because I'm a Cowboy fan, guys, I hate the Washington Commanders, used to be the Redskins. I hate the Philadelphia Eagles. I can't stand the New York Giants, but I don't hate them with a passion. That's a whole nother level of hate. Y'all hear me? 
And God hates abuse and violence with a passion. And it doesn't matter if it's physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, whatever, verbal abuse. It doesn't matter what kind of abuse it is. I need you to grasp this. He hates it with a passion. And I'm going to tell you right now, he don't tolerate it. And I promise you something else, this church doesn't tolerate it either. This pastor stands for you, we ain't going to tolerate it. I bring this up because if there's abuse going on in your home, in your marriage, with your family, anywhere outside of that, we want to know. And here's what I need you to understand. I'm not going to go attack the abuser. Well, no, I'm not. I promise. I won't. I'm not going to attack. Yes, I am. I'm going to attack them with the word of God. We will take that. We can help you through that process. We've done it before. And I promise you, if the other party is willing, we can make it work for everybody. God can step in and change anybody's heart. But one thing I need you to understand is if that heart doesn't change, we'll protect you on top of that. Do you understand me? Do you understand me, church? Amen. We don't tolerate it. God hates violence and abuse with a passion. The ninth and final thing that God hates whew, is a coward. Look at Revelation 21, 7 through 8. Anytime you say Revelation, that perks everybody up. You know what I'm saying? All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But cowards unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. What do y'all think about that list? What's at the top of it? Let me tell you why. Because if you're a coward, you can't fight all those other attacks you got to be strong and courageous to stand up against the devil. That's why God hates a coward. Guys, I, I mean, really, I want you to understand, if you, if you, if God, all right, you're like, well, my God, I'm not a coward. Okay, hang on. If God asked you to do something and you didn't do it because you were scared, you didn't do it because you might be embarrassed, you know, God told you to go pray with somebody, and you're like, mm, man, you know, that just ain't me, God. No, it's you. You're just a coward. And I need you to understand, if that's you, if that's you, you're in the same list as a murderer, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft. That's how much God hates when somebody is a coward. He puts you in there. Now, here's what I want you to say. You can grasp this. Y'all are like, good gosh, Micah. I've been in there. I've been in there. There's times I wasn't brave enough to step up and do what he told me to do. But guys, the problem is we got too many Christians today that are not stepping up. I have no doubt that's why the country and the world is the way it is. You know, we said something the other day when we were preaching on this whole political mess. By the way, thank y'all for letting me get through that. That was not easy. But that mess, we were talking about how there's 30 million Christians in the United States that don't vote. So now catch this. That's just to go vote. How many Christians do you think right now are cowards? A lot those 30 million for sure but think about the rest of them guys you know i hear pastors say all the time that there's a battle coming i'm here to tell you right now the battle's here and i need you to understand that god can't use a coward he can't because a coward's not going to be obedient a coward's not going to follow through with what god's asking of him and I'm telling you right now, the battle's here. And we need more Joshua's. 
We need more strong and courageous Christians to step up. That's why God hates a coward. He can't get his work done. He can, but he wants to use us. He gives us the opportunity to step up. He can snap his fingers and do it, but he wants us to be part of it. And I need you to understand, it tells you right here that cowards are not going to be in heaven, not going to be in God's kingdom when Jesus comes back. And I prayed about that, and I'm like, God, why is that? And he said, why would I let somebody in that didn't even lay one brick to build it? Yeah, I know, right? Guys, of all the things that we've talked about, all eight before this, this is the most important one. And here's why that is. If you're not brave enough to stand up against the battles and the attacks of Satan, that's those other eight. Those are the attacks. And if you're not courageous, how are you going to beat those attacks? It's the most important one. And I have no doubt that's why he put it at the top of that list. Listen, guys, God's word is not a coincidence. Every single word is put exactly where he wants it to be. That's why he put it on top of that list. He needs courageous people. And listen, I know it's hard. I know it's hard. In fact, the most courageous man, in my opinion, in the Old Testament was Joshua. Plus, he was half crazy, okay? God had to tell Joshua when Moses passed and Joshua had to take over. In, in chapter 1, you go look it up. In Joshua chapter 1, God had to tell him four times to be strong and courageous. Four times. Not one time. Not two, not three times, four times before Joshua was finally like, I got this. I know it's hard. I know it is, but here's the problem. Some of you have said you ain't strong enough a lot more than four times. A whole lot more. Guys, there comes a point where when you keep telling God no, Don taught me this, you'll find somebody else that'll say yes. So he wants to use you. He wants to use you to step up and to make a difference. The question I've got for you is, are you a courageous person? If not, now's the time to step up and quit being a casual Christian. You know what a casual Christian is? A lazy Christian. Casualness creates cowards. That's what creates a coward. You know, you're sitting back and you see where things need to be done in the church, in the community. You see where your family's getting torn apart and you're just sitting back thinking, oh, God's got this. You know what? Yeah, he's got it. But you got to step up and do your part. The whole thought process with God and us is he wants to use us. Yeah, God can snap his fingers and do anything he wants to do. But again, when you're sitting back and you see things that need to be done, and, and here's your thought process, well, I don't have the gifts for that. I'm not Moses. I'm not an eloquent speaker. I can't speak right. I just I couldn't even pronounce it the right way. I'm not an eloquent speaker, okay? Guys, I'm not smart enough. I don't know the word enough. People don't look at me as a strong Christian. Any of these excuses sound, you know, sound like, you know, familiar? I know they do to me. That's what a casual Christian does, and they expect somebody else to step up and do the job. I'm not important enough. Hmm. First of all, I'm going to tell you men, you fathers, you husbands, you better not be like that in your house. Don't force your wife to have to step up. Amen? God hates a coward. Let's review these nine of what God hates. Haughty eyes, lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that plots evil, feet that race to do wrong, a false witness who pours out lies, a person who sows discord in a family, Violence and abuse and the coward. 
Now, some of you may feel pretty bad. Some of you may have done some of these things on this list. But I am going to end this sermon better than a Hallmark movie. One, one of them Christmas ones. That are so predictable, by the way. You know, Amanda will be watching one of those. She, she loves those movies. She loves those Hallmark movies. But I'm going to go ahead and ruin the plot for everybody. This is how it goes. It doesn't matter which movie it is. I don't care if it's Christmas, Halloween, Thanksgiving, or Fourth of July. If that movie's on, this hat's going in, the dude is going to get with the girl that it's obviously supposed to be together, but they're going to go through all this drama to get there, and then at the end, they can all be happy. Everybody's going to be happy. Amen? That's a Hallmark movie. So we're going to end the sermon that way, okay? <laughs> Guys, I want to explain to y'all how much God hates sin. You know how much he hates sin? I, I'm going to put it to you this way. I hate sin. I hate it. But if you ask me to put one of my three daughters on a cross, I don't think I could do it. I don't think I could. And then I'd have to pick which one. I couldn't do it. I'm going to be honest with y'all. There's no way. And I hate sin. I hate it. That's how much he hates it. And that's how much he loves each one of y'all sitting out there right now. If you're looking at this list and one of them's hitting you in the face, I'm telling you right now, he died for that. He died for that. It's okay. He apologized for coughing. Guys, the love of God is unmeasurable. You know, I always, <laughs> I always try to ask him in my prayer times, God, is there any way, any way at all that you can show me just a little bit of how much you really love me? And he always brings me back to so many times in the Bible when somebody actually saw God, well, they didn't see his face, right? But saw the presence of God. Or they saw Jesus and their bodies couldn't handle it and they fainted. He told me, he said, you can't handle the love I got for you. There's no way. You'll never understand it. You'll never be able to measure it. Guys, regardless if this is you, I really need you to grasp this today. I don't want you to walk out of here beat up. I want you to walk out of here convicted. Do you understand me? If this is you, he died for it. All it takes is conviction. All it takes is repentance. And I promise you if you'll do that, yeah, you may lose some loved ones in the process. I'm not going to lie to you. It may happen. You may lose friends. You may lose a church. But you won't lose God. I promise you that. Aren't you so glad that our God hates sin, but he loves sinners like you and me? Amen.